I'm Marlene Francis, and what's my line? <laughs> I've got a secret. Going, Gary Moore. Thank you. Good evening. How very nice it is to have Miss Arlene Francis with us tonight. Welcome to another edition of I've Got a Secret. Before we go any further, let's say hello to the members of our panel who are, naturally, Bill Cullen, Betsy Palmer, Henry Morgan, and, of course, Bess Meyerson. That's the <laughs> Our panel, shall we have a go at it? All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, we will have a go at it. Will our first contestant come in, please? There we go. There we go. And there's the city firm. And there's the truck. And there we go. You have a seat, young man. And pull him real close to me. Will you tell, um... Hmm? All right. Say thank you, Gary. Okay. Thank you. Let's see how this is going to go. Thank you. Now, um, will you tell us... Thank you. Thank you. Right. That's absolutely right. <laughs> will you tell us what your names are and where you're from? I'm Clifton Kendrick. Uh, my big brother is Tim Timothy Michael, and I'm from Park Forest, Illinois. And this is Timothy, and this is Clifton. Now, before I ask each of these boys to whisper their secret, let me say that I know that long after I have retired and I look back on this show... The memory of this secret will always be one of the brightest ones in my whole entire time. Cliff, if you whisper your secret to me first, we'll show it at the same time to our audience at home. Ah. <laughs> uh. Yeah. Quite impressive. Now, Timothy, will you tell me what your Timothy, will you tell me what your secret is? <laughs> all right. Now you know why I say it's one of my favorites of all time. <laughs> Panel the clue to Clifton's. The clue to Clifton's and Timothy's secret concerns something they each did. We'll start the questioning with uh, Bess, please. <laughs> well, obviously, Timothy loves blondes because he's been flirting outrageously with Betsy. <laughs> uh, Cliff, this thing that both of you did, uh, did you do it at the same time? <laughs> no. No, at different times. Uh, were there any other people involved except the two of you? Just the two of you, right? Yes. Did it have to do with mother and dad in any way? No. <laughs> All right, there's twenty dollars down, sixty dollars to go, and we'll go please to Bill Cullen. Clifton, I'm sorry, I didn't hear any of your answers. I'm watching Timothy. He's, he's catching flies over there. <laughs> <laughs> For the benefit of our non-theatrical audience, I will say it's an old theatrical term, catching flies, meaning to make faces while other people are talking into the <laughs> <laughs> All right, William. Uh, uh, Clifton, this, uh, this thing that the two of you did, was it identical? Did you both do the same thing? No, sir. Uh, did you do it at different times? You at uh, a particular age and Timothy at the same age, for instance? Well, it was at different times, but not that... Uh, not as you described it. Was this a good thing you did, Clifton? I mean, are you proud of it? What Clifton did? Yes. yes. Are you proud of what Timothy did? No. <laughs> hey, all right, that's with $40 down, $40 to go, and we go to Betsy Palmer. Too. <laughs> oh, I wish I could do that, too. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. Ah, uh, Timothy. No, Timothy can't answer, can you, Timothy? Clifton, <laughs> did this have anything to do, only because of the way the audience reacts when Bill said flies, with baseball. No. <laughs> well, I thought it had something to do with the pirates. Ah, like uh, let's see. Did your brother do it? <laughs> You're spitting all over the place. That's Timothy. it. Did you do At his age, that's his privilege. <laughs> you <Yourself. laughs> That's right. <laughs> 
Because <laughs> you're laughing. You, you're laughing. You're out of range. <laughs> $60, to go when we go to Henry Morgan's meeting. Oh, boy. Oh, you know what he said? There, that charmer. Uh, <laughs> was there anything... Gary lets us talk like... <laughs> like a whole... <laughs> I want to give him a little ammunition. He's running out of spit. <laughs> yes, the one. No, I just, uh, I just say, you know, you can train in this business for a hundred years. And bring in a charm boy like that. <laughs> we have no talent at all. <laughs> now, let me tell you his secret. Now, young Clifton here is a very conscientious student, so when he was given an assignment by his biology teacher, he really worked at it. He spent a month collecting 40 different insects. Why? That's his part of the secret. What do you think his part of the secret he is? Ate he ate them. <laughs> he ate the whole collection of 40 bugs, butterflies, everything. Forty bugs. Forty bugs. What? Just a minute. What was it? What? What'd you eat? Why? Oh, you want the lollipop? It's not as habit, not as habit forming as bugs, but you can have it if you want. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, this is a charming story. As I say, this young man conscientiously made made a comprehensive. There you go. A comprehensive collection of forty bugs, and the young man ate them. <laughs> Mrs. Kendrick out here to hear about this story. Mrs. Kendrick, will you come out, please? <laughs> How did he get hold of the collection of bugs? Well, he's a mountain climber. That's about <laughs> all I can say. They're on a high shelf. And he got them, and when you came into the room, there he was sitting with an empty tray. No, he was popping the stink bug into his mouth. <laughs> and I asked him, no, no, Timmy, you didn't eat the bugs. And he said, oh, bugs, good, good, good bugs. <laughs> and he ate every last one of them, huh? All but the butterfly wings and the rear end of the beetle. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't eat them. be a gourmet. That's the best part. You missed it. You missed it. Well, it's certainly been a joy having you here with us. And we have a surprise for the young man over here. As soon as I can find the statement, where is it? Here we go. Surprise for you, Cliff. I want to make sure I had my facts right. When the Department of Entomology of the American Museum of Natural History heard of your loss, they offered to send you a complete collection of insects. They're on their way to you at home. I hope from now on, Timmy's appetite won't bug you. And thank you, Mrs. <laughs> Kendrick. I'll be with you in a minute. Oh, uh, panel, before we introduce our next contestant, you must put your blindfolds on. It is entirely possible that you would recognize them and there blow the whole thing. So put your blindfolds on and keep them on. Well, no, I see really no reason why you should not unmask so long as you make no comment after each of you has had your turn at questioning. Oh. oh. All right. So, Mr. X, if you will come on, please. <laughs> Now, Mr. X, if you'll whisper your secret to me, we'll show it at once to the audience at home.
Panel, the clue to Mr. X's secret concerns something he did, and we'll start with Betsy Palmer. Mi There's Timothy. <laughs> yes. Mr. X, did you do this um, recently? Uh, yes, I did. Did you do it, um, well, was it written up in the newspapers? Mm, yes, it was. $20 down, $60 to go. We go, please, to Henry Morgan. Yes, you may remove yours, but say nothing. I'm going to do a wild one here because that overture there sounded as though he won the war, but we didn't have oh, no. one lately. must have won the series, so it'd have to be Mazeroski. That's it! Listen, winning the series is bigger than winning the war. You know that. <laughs> Bill, I cannot describe to you when, what went on in New York. I know it must have been the havoc in Pittsburgh. But our whole, whole office, we were rehearsing our Tuesday night show. We knocked off rehearsals, got everybody there for the last three innings. And the way first the Bucks would get ahead, and then the Yankees would pass them, and then the Bucks would tie, and so forth. And here he came up to bat, the first man up to bat in the last of the ninth inning, tie score. Right? All right, now we have films of this thing. And before we discuss this thing further, I want to take a look at the films at the now famous home run that Mr. Mazurowski uh, hit last, last week. Can we take a look at him, Frank, if you will? Now, there's the crowd, excited enough. And here he stands there. And there it goes, and you'll see Yogi gazing at it and sadly as it goes over the fence. Yogi runs back to the clubhouse. It's all over. Now watch Bill. The happiest looking guy you ever saw. Look. Look at the crowd. Well, how long did it take you to get from the field to your dressing room? Well, it took about 15 minutes, and I finally made it. 15 minutes? Yes. Did you lose anything like your cap or buttons off your uniform or anything? Well, I haven't found my hat yet, and my glove is still lost. I don't believe I'll ever find it. <laughs> uh, did, did anybody, after the game was over, a kid, I, there are always kids outside of baseball parks, did anybody bring you the winning ball, the one, the home run that you hit? Well, uh, Gary, I had four or five balls brought to me, and uh, they all said it was the ball I hit, and they tried to sell it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can't be sure. You can't be sure, so you didn't, you, you didn't buy any. No yeah. use not having a genuine article. I noticed in the film that you seem to strike, I mean, the swing with great ease. Uh, it was a nice, smooth swing, and I was surprised when it went out of the park. I was watching. Um, did you feel that it was a homer when you hit it? Yes, I did, Gary. I had a nice, uh, uh, an easy swing. With, uh, my timing was just right, and I guessed right, and uh, hit it good, and I felt sure that it was going out of the park when I first hit it. I guess it's like golf. If you swing too fast, too hard, all you do is top it or something. Huh? That's right. You can't overswing. Well, I want to tell you that that home run blow made one of Pittsburgh's staunchest rooters mighty happy, our boy Bill Cullen. <laughs> and we sure want to thank you, Bill Mazeroski, for coming on our show tonight, and congratulations to you and your fellow world champions. Thank you. By the, by the way, Gary, uh, excuse me. I brought a ball here from Pittsburgh autographed by the world champions, the Pirates, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you knew anybody I could give that to. <laughs> no, I don't think there's anybody around here who's too happy. Ah, come on! Yeah. I don't think we do, Jenny, but I uh, brought this to your fellas. Yeah, uh, okay. Thank you for your yeah, support. You, you made me very happy last night. Right. I, I, I can't fool you. We had it planned, but I, I, I want, just wanted to see what your face would, would say when I said, no, nobody's in. <laughs> well, friends, your United Community Fund has one big job ahead this year. Won't you help them out with one big donation? You know, you're actually giving to many campaigns in one. You're helping 81 million Americans when you give the United Way. Uh, on Friday night, by the way, CBS will bring you the fourth historic face-to-face -face meeting of Vice President Nixon and Senator Kennedy. With election day only three weeks away, it's important to know where the candidates stand on the major issues of this campaign. So be sure to watch Friday's discussion, which will be on foreign policy, here on CBS. And now it is with great pleasure that I introduce our special guest for tonight, a delightful actress, panelist, gracious lady, more recently best-selling author of That Certain Something. Here is Miss Arlene Francis.
So nice to have you over on this side of the fence for a change. It seems strange to be sitting next to a moderator. I like it. <laughs> How are you? Very well. Wow. Distinguished panel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean you yes. noticed the other one and we looked at the other one. <laughs> You are all that. I've loved the show so far, and I've loved the fact that you mentioned very wisely that people must be sure to watch the uh, great encounter uh, on Friday night. I'm glad you mentioned it. I hope they will, because they've all been quite fascinating for mm -hmm. one reason or another. I think that really that uh, it would be a very good idea if there were more people debating on television, not necessarily about politics, but <clears throat> almost any subject. People have opinions. They ought to be aired. They ought to have a chance to speak, and there should be controversy and discussion and it would wake everybody up well if you're looking for controversy if you can think of an interesting topic i've got the most controversial group over here you ever saw they have definite opinions on any subject is there any particular subject you would like to hear them debate i'd like to hear them debate a whole lot of subjects but on the air i think it would be marvelous <laughs> since there are two boys and two girls i am counting correctly and since as i look out into the audience it looks as though there's about an even division between the men and women, and since men and women are as important a subject as any other, why don't they debate on the battle of the sexes? That's as good huh? an idea as any. We'll, we'll divide the panel into two teams, Bill and Henry versus Bess and Betsy, and if we can open the curtains, please, we have an appropriate arena set for this debate. <laughs> now, you will notice there are two identical lecterns and two identical stools and the lighting on each side of our platform is also identical. And the makeup. And the makeup. So, Henry, if you and Bess will step to the lecterns, that's Henry and Bess, and then Bill and Betsy, if you will go to the stools behind your two teammates, you will be the anchor man in this no, debate. All right. So they All right. You go. First. You go. Now, you go to a lectern, Bess. You go to and the lectern. Betsy and, and Bill, go up and get on one of the stools. All righty. Now, here's the way we'll go. You will be given a maximum of one minute to answer. Your opponent will be given, give, have a maximum of one minute for rebuttal. After which you will change places with your teammates. Miss Francis will ask another question. So, are you uh, ready, Mr. Morgan and Miss Myerson? Yes. yes Miss uh, yes. uh, Francis, will you take over? Yes, I want you to think of me now as a cross between Ed Murrow and Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> That's quite Very a cross hard. to bear. Very hard. <laughs> All right, I just happen to have some questions with me. My first question is for you, Senator, uh, Ms. Meyerson. Senatress. Uh, Senatress. <clears throat> Your opponent in this debate, Henry Morgan, was quoted in a 1958 newspaper interview as saying this, and I quote, Women take it much harder than men when they fail to come up with the right answer. They're always trying to prove they're as intelligent as men. End of quote. This statement implies that Mr. Morgan feels that women are not as smart as men. Now, what is your opinion of this statement, Bess Myerson? And do you stand in defense of yourself and all womankind? <laughs> no offense. We take that. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> no physical contact, Bess. Oh, not at all. <laughs> well, um... I happen to think that Henry is smarter than a lot of women. I don't know if he's smarter than we two. <laughs> I mean, after all, Henry, you can't... Yes? yes no, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, 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 please, you're not, not allowed rebuttal one, at this one time. One minute, oh. uh, Bess, and time is of the essence. I want you to defend the platform of the woman. Well, I don't think that it's important, really, for the woman to be told that she's more intelligent or to receive recognition for this great brilliance that she has. You know, I just think that deep inside she knows it, and uh, she's perfectly willing to make an open concession to please the... Uh, the opposite insecure, sex. yes, uh, emotions of the opposite sex. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bess. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's very well stated. Now, Mr. Morgan, would you like to defend the position that you took in 1958, and do you still stand on it? I was misquoted. <laughs> I want to make it perfectly clear. <laughs> That's what both the candidates always claim. <laughs> I want to be just as clear. <laughs> I uphold Bess's right to her opinion, such as it is. <laughs> I think that uh, the statement I made, if I made it, which I doubt, was probably ridiculous because I only meant that some men are smarter than some women, and it is not important who is smarter than whom. And you can't please all the people. And you can't please all the, all the people, and I want to make that clear. <laughs> Mr. 
change, now let's change places, if you will. Change places, and we'll get Betsy and Bill up here and see what they can offer. Uh, Miss, Miss Francis, have you any dangerous quotes from the past of either of these people? I do have another dangerous quote, and I hope it's more dangerous than the last one, because there were, really wasn't much of a debate going on there, I wouldn't say. Would you, Gary? I just thought Henry showed that he's a weasel, that's all. <laughs> And, uh, Pretty rotten. And so now I would like to uh, 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 challenge uh, Betsy here uh, by addressing first Bill. There is some question today as to whether the American woman is becoming too self-sufficient. Your opponent, Bill, Miss uh, Palmer, was quoted in the newspapers recently as saying, and I quote, just as I did with Henry, who denied it, and I presume Betsy will be more decent because that's the way women are, I quote... <laughs> I've always been a pretty independent creature. I've managed to stand on my own two feet, end of quote. Betsy's quote represents the views of millions of women today. The implication of this quote is that men are no longer as important or as necessary. Oh, no, as... that's <laughs> wrong. What does it imp uh, imply? Well, I oh. didn't imply that at all. I mean, there's, uh, that's, that's, un that's unqualified, that statement of the way you're giving it, but there are certain qualifications that go with that statement. You're talking on his time. Oh, <laughs> that is no, what I mean. No, she may answer, I'm checking the lighting, and I don't... <laughs> Actually... I'm, uh, I'm glad you asked that question, Arlene. Do you remember what it was? What was the question? <laughs> no, it's the reason I'm glad you asked it. Uh, no, as a matter of fact, my wife and I were discussing that question just the other night. Your That's wife, Pat? Huh? Your wife, Pat? Well, what she does is her own business. Her name's Anne. <laughs> straight man all the time and these men are how they get on. No, and uh, actually she was over in the corner saluting the children as I become up. <laughs> With apologies to Mort Saul, I'm sorry. Yes, that was much. really his answer and yes. I was just back. Uh, no, Arlene, I think my answer to your question at a time like this has to be definite and I want to say in behalf of not only myself but all of our supporters. I mean those people You're who have gone out and worked anything, so hard no. for us. People who realize that our cause is something and mean something, American people. Make it clear. But you're not. Uh, <laughs> on behalf of them, and even on behalf of the people who worked against us, because... You've got the garbage. He said absolutely nothing. Aren't we supposed you to do this for real? Let's see if you can say something, sure. Betsy. Well, all I can say is that that statement that I supposedly made was taken out of context as something that I must have said that went along with all of that. Another well, weasel, eh? <laughs> really feel that I enjoy standing my own two feet, but the only reason why I ever got to stand on my own two feet is because of the man I am married to and because of the people who raised me and my background. And if I do stand on my two feet, I have them to thank, and I'm proud of them. You will <laughs> notice how well you <laughs> Is there, uh, you will notice, uh, Mr. Cullen, that uh, Betsy answered in a forthright way yes. and very honestly you on the other hand beat around the bush as so many people are wont to do these yes. days I, well, uh, now would you like to be a little more direct now you have another opportunity betsy is there a question you would like to ask put to him yes doesn't your wife stand on her own two feet and why <laughs> yes because they're closer to her than anyone else. <laughs> Well, I bet I no one ever debated with a baseball in their pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Francis, would you care to make a summation on behalf of the fair sex? Do you, uh, what did you gain from this event? <laughs> I gained that the women were the only ones that were willing to stand on their own two feet in the debates. I really do think that. I think the men, charming as I believe they are, uh, always uh, vacillate, if I may use the word. And the women are much more direct. And therefore, I think the women have really won this round. Unless Beth has something she'd like to add. I don't that think may lose it for us. Oh, yeah, we better. <laughs> Go ahead, Brad. <clears throat> we were just thinking if any fellas are going to like us anymore. <laughs> well, well I was just like going to say, my summation is that I think that the women probably proved to be more forthright. The gentlemen proved to be the better politicians. They know they're going to have to work with these two young ladies next week, and they don't want their shins bruised under the table. He's and so speaking right. for Arlene Francis and all of us here, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much. <laughs>